Welcome to the Jeff Knows Inc. Entrepreneurial Podcast with your host, Jeff Lopes. Jeff has over two decades experience as a serial entrepreneur, building brands like KimuraWare from his home basement to a multi-million dollar global brand that has sold over a quarter million pairs of boxing gloves. Jeff's here to educate, guide, and drive you on the process of bringing your ideas and dreams to reality with the inspiring stories from some of the top business minds. Welcome to episode 160 of the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lope. Super excited to have on today, Ron Van Cleef, a.k.a. the Black Dragon. Great conversation, tons of incredible stories. Sit back, everyone, and enjoy. This podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. With the current climate in this world, it's now more important than ever to take stock in your mental health and for once, take time to work on yourself. BetterHelp offers a personalized online counseling and therapy service that will connect you to a safe and private online environment. BetterHelp is here to assess you with your needs and match you with your own licensed therapist. It's a lot more affordable than your traditional counseling and financial aid is always available. Right now, Jeff Knows Inc. listeners get an extra 10% off your first month just by visiting BetterHelp.com forward slash Jeff Knows. That's right. Visit B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com forward slash Jeff Knows to get 10% off your first month. We are live. We are live in the Jeff Nozine podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lopes. Super excited to have on today, Ron Van Cleef. What is up, brother? Life is good living here in Hawaii. Aloha, everybody. This is, uh, for God, there's so many stories we're going to talk about today and so many different different areas we're going to be targeting today because this is going to be a fun conversation. I met Ron probably about 10 or 12 years ago with my company, Kamora, where we did a, a Black <laughs> Dragon t shirt for him. And Full circle, almost 10 or 12 years later, I have on my podcast, and there's so much he's done in the last 10 or 12 years, so we're going to be talking about that, but let's start off with where you were brought up. I want our audience to kind of get to know your history, where you are brought up, your childhood, your upbringing, what got you into the Marine Corps, all that stuff like that. Let's start off there, a little history on Ron. Okay. Um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah. Uh, my father was a merchant lady. And uh, my mother was a house cleaner, house lady. Yeah. And um, I started my martial arts training in Brooklyn at the St. John's Community Center in 1959. What, what pushed you to try martial arts? Because, I mean, this is not something that everybody would do gymnast. back then. I was, what? A, I was a genius most of my life. Oh, so you had that athletic ability already to start. And it supremely helped in martial arts because most martial arts guys are not in good shape. They may have good technique, but they're not in good, you know? Like yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and so uh, I met a guy, his name was Kenny Hall. He was one of the first um, African-Americans to be into the uh, world-class bodybuilding. Um, started training when I was 13. And by the time I was 17, I looked like a bodybuilder. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I was like a bodybuilder, you know, heroes like um, one of my first mentors was Joe Bonomo. I don't know who, if you know who Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. He was like the stunt guy for Papillon Cassidy. Yeah. He had a fitness center in Manhattan next to uh, Central Park. And I, at the time, was working at the Red Duke Physical Culture Center. Yeah. Uh, training celebrities there, you know. I ran into him one day after knowing him as a kid looking up to him as a hero like <clears throat> you don't know how long Cassidy but that was a very uh very heroic cowboy yeah I think in the 40s and 50s interesting guy Bill Hayes he he started his uh, acting when he was in his 40s so he never got any young pictures um 
So uh, I met Moses Powell. Yeah. At the St. John's Community Center. This was when I was probably 15. Yeah. 14 or 15. Yeah. Um, I started training with uh, Professor Moses Powell in the art of San Lucas Jiu Jitsu. But at the community center, it was an, an amazing place because Ronald Duncan, the father of American Jiu Jitsu, taught there. Yeah. George Cofield taught there from Tang Dojo. Professor D taught there. So it was a, a, a mecca for martial arts, but nobody knew about it. It was a community center in Brooklyn. In yeah, that's, 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 that's crazy, huh? <laughs> All of these people that were just black folks at the time have either passed away or they've become grandmasters. You know? Yeah. yeah. So I, I joined Marine Corps in 1960, but I, I started studying with Sensei Urban and that's Peter Urban when I was 17, just before I went to Marine Corps. He, had, he actually helped me make my choice from Army to Marine yeah. Corps. Um, I studied Goju, Aikijitsu, um, Ninjitsu, Sanukas, uh, uh, Vijitsu. Until I went into the military, I didn't have any experience firsthand from Asian teachers, Oriental teachers. <laughs> so when I went to Okinawa yeah. as a Marine, my first thing I found a dojo where uh, the Shorin Ryu Okinawan traditional karate was being taught. And it was taught by a grandmaster who was a grand, you know, he's a long yeah. karate, but he was like a fourth or fifth degree, which was like a, a demigod. You know yeah, what I mean? Of course, yeah. Um, so that's where I really started. Um, I was uh, kicking the heavy bag in the gym one day, and uh, Ken Norton, the boxer, told me, Stop fucking kicking the bag, man. This bag's not for kicking. <laughs> how long ago that is? <laughs> the 60s. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I went to Okinawa. I went to Vietnam. Um, saw a lot of horrible stuff. Uh, damage, like anyone else that would see so much. At, I, at such, I a, to- such a young age, too. I went in the country at 18. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, the, the stories I'm sure you could tell. M60 just... machine gun. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So how long? It's, how many? How many years did you? How many years? How many years did you serve for? Six years, four months. Yeah. How did that alter and change your mind? Like just like um, when you came out, were you were you a different person altogether? Oh yes. <clears throat> oh yes. That completely changed my uh, outlook on the world, you know, and, and daily life. Did it when make you, you appreciate life more or did it make you more? Oh, my goodness, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, see, you, you, start, you start living with less, with, with that mindset of, of, of no regret at that point, right? Because just you, you see what, how much, how mode. much horror, of, yeah, of course, total it's survival It's only survival mode. mode. Yeah. Um, I am an M60 machine gun, you know? Yeah. And that's uh, that's quite a piece of equipment, you know? Very loud, very, you know, very devastating. Yeah. Years have uh, had problems from that because we didn't have... <laughs> no, you didn't have nothing. No, it was a no, different, well, different, different world altogether, right? Why? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I um, I beat the Marine Corps in 1965. I got my... Um, I was discharged in 1966 because I had to go into the reserves for six months. During that time, I, um, oh, yeah, I was at Transit Police Department. I became a policeman in New York. You did, huh? I was a transit cop for 65 to 69. Interesting. I go the trains as a transit cop. You know, throwing bums off the train. You know that whole. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my gosh, from Coney Island to the Bronx. <laughs> that's a, that's a long trip. You know? it's, it's over an hour one way. Yeah. 
and you just go from car to car to car. Are, were, were you uniformed or ununiformed? Uh, uniform. Yeah, uniformed. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, you meet a ton of characters, huh? Yeah, I did that until 1969. But during the interim, I joined the Negro Ensemble Company with the Douglas Turner War. Yeah. And Louis V and Robert Hooks. So many wonderful uh, actors. Julius Harris. What what pushed you towards that? Was that somebody that told you to do that or something you saw? When I when I left the Marine Corps, I became a hippie. I got you a, did, huh? I got an apartment down in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the East Village. <laughs> Sixty three dollars a month of that, like a six room giant place on uh, in the East Village. You can't even you can't even rent for an hour now in New York down in New York for sixty three dollars. So much acid and you know, just cool, everything, you know, everything. Interesting that I really started concentrating on competing in karate. You know? mm-hmm. I won my first world championship in 1965. And this is the time period when you were going through the hippie stage? Yeah. I would go to work tripping on sunshine. Or mescaline or whatever. Seriously, and huh? Right train. This is this is the last this is the last thing I thought you were gonna say to me today. That's crazy. Can you imagine now? <laughs> <sighs> and how long did that go on period wise? But I'm sure even in back then you saw probably a lot of um close friends overdose and stuff, right? I'm assuming. Oh my goodness, so many. And my friend Jimi Hendrix. Um so you you were friends with Jimi Hendrix? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I worked at a place called the Electric Circus, bouncing there. So I knew the Rolling Stones and knew Mick. I, I trained his wife Bianca for about three years. Oh, in martial wow. arts. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I worked yeah. at a gym for the Radu Physical Culture Center, probably from when I came back from Hong Kong, 80, 81 through ninety three, when I left the Secret Service. Um, it was a place where only celebrities trained. Brad Pitt, J Lo. I trained uh, Donald Trump's wife, Marla Naples, for two years before she was, she was president. I, yeah. I, I met him a few times at the gym. <laughs> Interesting, right? Oh, it's crazy. Uh, it's crazy, right? Anthony Quinn, George Benson. Um, Tony Martin. Yeah. So many, so many big celebrities. Vanessa Williams. Vanessa yeah. Um, Sarah Jessica Parker. So you trained all these people. Matthew Broderick. Yeah. Matthew Modine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, I owe that to my my mentor, Radu Teodorescu. Yeah. He's a... Uh, He's a goal, he's an Olympic gold maker, a gold award maker. And uh, Nadia Komenich was one of his uh, protégés, you know? Yeah. Um, an amazing guy. He, he gave me a job, and I, the first day I was teaching Cindy Crawford. Imagine teaching Cindy Crawford martial arts for fitness, right? Yeah. In this giant 5,000 square foot gym on 57th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue. Which is a whole city block, pretty much. Amazing. Yeah. Ask. We had ropes to the ceilings. Overhead track. It was well, what, 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 what year was this in, roughly? Uh, 81 through 94. So you are there for quite a few years. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so through that process, that, is that where you started your acting already? Well, I had joined the... Um, Negro Ensemble Company, and then yeah. I had a friend of mine who was a stuntman, Harry Matson, yeah. who uh, inducted me into the East Coast Stuntman's Association in probably 1967. You know, I, I spent a lot of time on television in the early days. I, I worked on um, Ryan's Hope. You know, yeah. I worked on a bunch of these soap operas. I was a bartender at the Crystal Palace at one of these soaps, you know. <laughs> um, I worked on Oz, um, 14 episodes of Oz. I was uh, Saeed's 
uh, cellmate. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Run there almost five years. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've, I've tried to maintain um, some work ethic in as far as the, the business, you know? Yeah. But I'm going to be 80 in another year. I mean, it's, I it's, crazy. Crazy. It's, 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 so, it's incredible how time <laughs> flies. I remember sitting in, in, in Beijing with Ali talking to him about the old days when I, when I met him. I, I used to work for Muhammad Ali. Yeah. It was a company called Muhammad Ali Professional Sports. We sold all of the memorabilia. I, I see him every day. You know? Yeah. What a nice man. Went up to his training camp in Pennsylvania. You know, just... So when you when you were with Ali, was that later on already in his career or during his is it his peak time? During his heyday. So during give me his... give me give me give me a good story of Ali. Give me a good Ali story. Are you ready to unlock your full potential? I want to introduce you to the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast, a powerful resource to transform your life today. With expert interviews, practical tips, and inspiring stories, this podcast is your roadmap to lasting wellness. Here's what a listener has to say. I used to struggle with my health, but this podcast changed everything. It's like having a personal trainer, nutritionist, and life coach totally for free. With over 2,000 five-star reviews we're a podcast you can trust the fit healthy and happy podcast available now wherever you get your podcasts one day i was uh, on central park with my bike and either i got hit by a car or something and my bike had turned over i fell off my bike and there's a limo pulls up and who jumps out muhammad ali ronnie <laughs> Fuck is this? You know, I said, man, I, I was, you know, whatever, boom. Took my bike, put it in the back of the limo, and drove me to Radu's. <laughs> a really, really nice man. Um, I, I worked for Muhammad Ali Professional Sports for about two and a half years. Yeah. They, they, uh, they liked the idea of martial arts, and we formed the first Team USA. I yeah. had a team that we did for um, a company like the World Boxing Council, and we fought all over the world in the seventies, the eighties, and into the nineties. Really fascinating. Oh, it's crazy! Yeah, tons of tons of tons of knowledge there. There, and you know, I had a chance to study with Liam Ting. I spent almost ten years in Hong Kong. So I, I, I did some in Chung. I did some uh, monkey style. Some Tai Chi, some Qi Gong. You know, in, in ten years, you and in Hong Kong, they like the fact that you want to do different things. Yeah, it's not like here in America, where if you're going to study something else, your your sense it goes batshit, right? Yeah. No, I, I learned at an early age that you have to exceed the limits of your mind in order to make your body function. At a level there, you're, you're yeah, yeah, not satisfied with, but you understand the, the process, you know. So I, I decide one day, watching TV with my student time out the last drive. We're watching pay per view UFC one or two. I forgot. Yeah, I said I have to do this. You know, you know what I mean? Who wouldn't want to do that? Honestly. Who wouldn't want to do that? Yeah. Right? I call up SEG. No, this this card is already filled. Number two is already filled. No, 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 you're too old for number three. Um, then I speak to um, the owner of SEG. And he finally gave me someone by the name of Campbell McLaren, who is the vice president of the company. He came to my dojo, he worked in spa, you know, moved around, looked out, all that stuff. Next day they called me and they said, uh, we want you for UFC 4. I was like a kid in the candy store. <laughs> wow! You know, immediately 
hit the gym, put on 25 pounds. You did. And how long? Um, almost three months. Yeah, yeah. 25 pounds. And I, I was training in time, judo, you know. Combinations, yeah, different. yeah. All um, around, all around. Pulling my girlfriend's car around the block with the chain, you know, <laughs> crazy, insane, crazy stuff. Um, regiment of like a thousand push ups a day, that kind of stuff. You know. I break my left ankle one week before I fight horse. Seriously, uh, I never knew that. Fuck. Yes, yeah. I was messing with the guy whose name is Leon Stevenson. Six foot five, 320. He hit me with a suplex. My ankle hit the frame of the mat. You know, the yeah, 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 yeah. And I broke my ankle one week before I fought twice. I could have probably walked. It was unbelievably painful, but I could not, I could not, not do it. I couldn't. Yeah, yeah. I said, what if I were to speak? You still have to be able to function, right? In, in reality, right? That's that military thinking, right? <laughs> Even if this arm is off, you still have, you know. Um, so I, I went, and it was a beautiful experience. It, it truly, truly was. Um, to last four and a half minutes with someone of that plateau uh, uh, of training in Jiu-Jitsu, he was like supreme at that time. Yeah, it was it was still very like I mean if you if you think of the early days of the UFC, I mean that was still very unknown, right? They 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 altered and changed how people perceive these martial arts, right? Yeah, no gloves, no yeah. time limit, no yeah. weight division. Yeah, I'm like, how could someone not want to do that? That's so fucking exciting, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I get to share this when I think about it. You know, I mean, it's 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 it's, 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 it's as close as you're going to get to a blood sport movie in real life. Right. I mean, at that time, that was kind of the transition where, and that's what I think attracted a lot of, I mean, martial art movies were so popular then. And, and I think that's what attracted a lot of people to the UFC. The early UFC was just that raw, like no way class, different martial arts. Who's the best. And obviously it's, it's, it's so evolved to the point where everybody is so well-rounded nowadays, but uh, it was so interesting seeing that at the beginning stages. Right. You know, and, after I fought boys, I met Elio and I met the family and yeah. asked and everyone. Um, I was appointed the commissioner of the UFC. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yes, for two years. And uh, what I did was I set up the fights. I created the super fight. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I went to court. I designed all the basic rules for, for MMA competition in the different AU compatible organizations. I wrote the original rules and makes for that. Um, I did that for about two years and I, I was, I, I'm an avid believer in the sport, yeah. you know, but some of the things that I saw go on, you know, corruption kind of stuff. Uh, one fighter's paid zero, the other one's paid fifty thousand. Just so much crazy stuff. And that's that's somewhat got a little better. I was in the last. It's, it's only been the last three or four years, five years maybe. I mean, if you look at even as as of eight, nine, ten years ago, I mean, athletes in the UFC were making more off sponsorship than they were off their off yes, their. Of uh, course. Of of their thing right i mean i mean you get a a new ufc athlete he was getting if he was lucky five and five some was 25 and 25 Mm -hmm. so even five and five even if they win ten thousand dollars to train for three months pay your trainers pay your manager pay your nutritionist pay your personal train you're done you're you're in a negative by time you actually fight for sure so i mean that has changed a bit i mean there are there are i mean just like every sport you get your top athletes are going to make the most but it's still very, I mean, when you look at martial arts in general, when you think of the UFC, I mean, as a pro athlete, they're still very underpaid. You know, I was the first commissioner of the UFC. Yeah. Then we did the first of the UFC fighting camps. 
yeah. it is the voice and Dennis Jama. Yeah, yeah. Amazing, amazing. So much talent. These guys were really talented. You know, they they were they were expert in their arts. Maybe someone with another kind of thing might get them or whatever, but yeah. within their paradigm, they're excellent. All of them. I roll with guys two, three nights a week, five minute rounds, four or five of those would be no one's anywhere near my age. These guys are in their twenties and thirties. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And they're crying on my back. My back. <laughs> I said, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm gonna be 80 years old and and I kept the psych control for two minutes. Stop it. So Stop you're it. so your 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 Brazilian Jiu Jitsu started, your quest started how many years ago now? You said 2011. 2011. So 10 years. And now you're officially a purple belt. Purple belt a year and three months ago. Okay, so you, you, you're you on your quest for your and black Kelsey belt. Says, yes. Of course. And Kelsey said to me, it's going to take another four or five years. I got nothing but time. <laughs> I've got nothing but time. Right? I love it. Oh, of course. I love it. I love it. I love and it. I will compete when I make my black belt. I don't care if I'm 85. <laughs> I, I will, it. you know, I fought in the worlds just before the pandemic hit. And I, yeah. I lost the second match, but the guy was 35 years old. But it was just, man, it was great, you know? It still, it still, it still, it still juices you up, the, that live competition, huh? I, I like the... Um, the rawness of it? The, no, the purity. Yeah, I love that word, yeah. In that it's just, there's no emotion, you don't hate this guy. It's not, it's, it's not like that. It has nothing to do with that, actually. Yeah. You get into this harmonious interplay. Yeah. That becomes almost electric. Yeah. I watch a guy from go from a Kumura to Omoplata to, to, to Amba to, to you know the ability to. Oh, I mean, there's a reason why. Is there a reason why they compare it to chess? Right. It's just there's so much thought process it is, into it. It is chess. I want. Yeah. I, I work guys and they'll go through six or seven things just to get me with the first thing they started with. Yeah. It's and if you, if you always talk to anybody at a higher level, I mean, it's, it's, they always say from a purple belt to a black belt, the only difference is the black belt is always three, four moves ahead. Uh, maybe five. Yeah. Maybe five. The average yeah. guys. Um, they, they're really talented. Uh, I had yeah. misjudged that before I, I got into yeah. it. No, I said, ah, I'm still having, you know, whatever. <laughs> Man, it was a wonderful, wonderful event UFC for, which I'll always remember. You know, imagine the feeling stepping into the octagon face and voice crazy. How beautiful could that? That's yeah, yeah. You can't pay someone to have that feel. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. How did it, when you went in there? What was your knowledge of of? Of Hoist Gracie. What was you like? Did you know how talented he was? Did you know, like, I, I, only, more... saw him in one, I only saw him in one UFC. Yeah, and so you, knew, you didn't have much knowledge of him. And I didn't even care. Yeah. yeah. You know? um, when you do what I've done for so many years, it doesn't matter what they're doing. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. It's a fascinating part, Jiu Jitsu. Unlike karate, karate or kung fu, it's bim, bang, slap, kick, whatever. Yeah. There are no strikes. Yeah. So when you take out all the strikes, what do you have then? A myriad of movements designed to fit whatever frame you are. Yeah. Big, fat, short, tough. all of it works. I have, a, I have a rolling partner, his name is Alejandro, six foot eight, three four. I roll big, with him every boy. time. Yeah. He's like 35 years old. You know? Yeah. But I roll with him every chance I get. Every chance I get. Because he's amazing to roll with. I've got him in the guillotine, right? And I didn't have the strength to close it because he has a 24 inch neck you understand yeah he picks me up like a piece of garbage and <laughs> splat, you know? <laughs> i broke five ribs 
I bit through my tongue, six pitches on my tongue. This is just rolling or is this competition? No, uh, rolling with Alejandro. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That day he slammed me, he, he, I, I wound up him sitting on my chest. Oh, I love it. So I, I was out for about uh, six months, you know. I started doing drills. But I, I didn't start rolling until maybe eight or nine months later. Yeah. yeah. BJJ, I, you do get you do get a lot of injuries. You do get a lot, a lot of injuries because, especially when you're rolling. I mean, it doesn't matter what age, but you're rolling with young. These guys, aggressive. Are they're a very, very aggressive, right? Oh, young, okay. aggressive. Especially, yeah. I mean, is is you're you you probably have less injuries rolling with a black belt than you would ever with a white belt. Of it's course. the white belts that go crazy and they go crazy. And, uh, gone. I'll, I'll get the triangle, <laughs> and they're so <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's beautiful, but it's not it's not enjoyable rolling with them. I do because yeah. I don't care when I go. You know, I, I go. How many how many how many times a week do you train now? Two, two times, yeah. two, three, four, five rounds, yeah. you know, five minute rounds, really good, two hour class, you know? Yeah. Nobody's over 45. Do you do any other martial arts right now? Or? No, yeah. I'm only doing this for the past nine and a half years. I stopped doing everything, no kicking, no, nothing. And how, how does your body feel? Different. It yeah. feels much different. A good different or a bad different? Uh, probably a good different because everyone I know in my age group have already had knee replacements, uh, hip replacements, surgeries, walking sticks, uh, yeah, crutches, everything. I have a couple of orthoscopics on my left knee. Other than that, but you're you're you're, and you're a the right shoulder replacement. <laughs> You're, you're a different animal. You're a different animal altogether. There's a reason why you're called a black dragon. There's, it's just, <laughs> you're most. It's a, I, I it's mean, a you're most. Thing, man. Oh, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. I mean, you're obviously very, very special, right? And 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 you have a passion, and and it's you amazing know, is how I, your passion. Eighty years since you started martial arts, but 65, 70 years later, you still have that passion, which is incredible. I'm smoking a joint with Bruce Lee in a hotel in Manhattan. After I lost at the All American Championships, 1966-67, he calls me the Black Dragon because we're smoking. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, yeah. we're smoking philosophy, psychology, you know, technique, everything. That actually piqued my interest in Wing Chun at that time, you know, which was very interesting. But he gave me that name, the Black Dragon, and like eight years later, I make a film the Black Dragon. It was like. What the fuck, Bruce? What is this, man? Huh? I, I saw him about. So he's the one who gave you that nickname. Yes, yes. Oh, that's pretty amazing. I, I had no clue. That was that's a pretty amazing little story there. A, a really nice man. A really nice. You know, yeah, give me give me a couple of good stories of him because you must have uh, tons of stories. He did an exhibition at the uh, Ed Caucus International tournament in Long Beach, either 67 or 68. Yeah. We just did a demonstration with this, this fellow, Victor Moore. And Victor Moore was a really good fighter during his time. He beat Joe Lewis, he beat Chuck Norris, he beat Bill Wallace, he beat all the champions. Yeah. Very tough, athletic, uh, technical, ex-marine, that mentality. Yeah, so tough, tough as nails. Tough, tough, tough as nails. And Bruce and I were talking, he says, well, I'm going to use it for my demonstration because he thinks he can block my punch. So I, I witnessed that. That demonstration. Part that I was talking about. It's it's interesting what you can do if you prearrange what you're doing. You know, um, if I know what technique you're doing, then I know what 
I'm going to do to defend it or whatever, right? Yeah. And so it becomes then tiny speed. Then yeah. It becomes that. You know? Let's not talk about the accuracy or the target training or anything, but just the timing and speed make all the difference in the world. Yeah. You know, I competed, I competed many times on acid. Many times, many, many times. It looked as though they were moving in slow motion. You could block their technique, block it and counter at the same time and not realize you do and do some more things. And the referee would have to pull you apart because so you, you, you overkill. The first first was a point, five more later. Yeah. But I had drilled myself, and I used self-hypnosis for many years to do at least 20 techniques in that forward motion. In 20, whether it was first contact, not forward, forward contact, but forward move time, or kickboxing, point karate, that was my modus, just, you know, complete. And I guess domination through technical advancement, right? Yeah. Um, and that worked for years. I competed for about 55 years. I stopped competing in karate in the 60s. Four fights, all the guys on there, you know, and I, I, I won the All American Karate Championship and first place in Canada at 60. Yeah. They, I retired from karate competition. I couldn't do any better than that, no matter what, right? When you when you got the roles in those movies, in that series of movies for the Black Dragon. I made 10 of those. 10 of those. Yeah. <laughs> They're all being released now. High definition. Just blowing my mind. I'm starting to see them all over the internet, Amazon, all these places. Yeah. How was how your, let's go back to that. I mean, how was your contract with that? Like, do you make anything off these now or no? No, no. So it wasn't obviously negotiated back then. No one thought about the long term of these. I races. never thought about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, as I said, when I got the part as the Black Dragon, it yeah. was out of nowhere. I was being I was being represented by Black Beauty Marvin Agency in New York City. Yeah. Betty White was my agent. Betty White? Betty White was my agent. She said, Ryan, I got something for you. Come down to the office. And talk. Do, 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 you, do you still have a do you still have a relationship with her? Not in the past 20 years since I moved. She she's yeah. one that's defined the time to the max. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing woman. She used to flirt with me. She was she was, <laughs> she was really, really quite lovely. And I owe her. Um, she got me a SAG contract to do five films. You know, typical sad stuff. Um, but it was an opportunity to go to Hong Kong. And I loved Hong Kong. I did yeah. many times in own service. So I went to Hong Kong. And it was quite an experience, a whole new, a whole new experience. Hong Kong's um, film is different from what we do here. The whole system, you've got a crew of six people, they do everything like sound electrician this that. they do everything transportation everything all in one location for the whole shoot oh so they do everything yeah okay we, we would shoot a feature in three weeks wow else. wow really yeah really? yeah and, and in North America, you're looking at what three, four months minimal for that? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. And everybody did everything. Some guys did lighting. I mean, it was like a family. It's, I don't know how to explain it, but it's a different feeling. Everybody is working together harmoniously. Yeah. The, the team spirit thing is evident, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's different from working here in the States. And I've worked on many film projects. I worked on over 100 films. You know? I was uh, Samuel Jackson's stunt double for Die Hard with a Vengeance. You know, what a cool, 
I'm, I'm going to the set, right? I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't like. Your, we talked about your talked about your your social media, and I'm like, how like you've accomplished so much in your life, Ron? Like, I don't, don't understand how you're not like so globally well known. You should be at a different level for everything you've accomplished, or the celebrities you've been around, or the people. I'm, I'm you've actually known. an introvert, man. I'm actually an introvert, but you know, I go to the set, right? Yeah. The, the stunt coordinator brings me over to, to meet Sam because yeah. I'm going to be a stunt double, right? And he says, oh, I know this motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, it was, it was beautiful. You know, it's beautiful. <laughs> I love it. Do you have any other Bruce Lee stories? When you filmed with him, you filmed two movies, you said, right? I filmed two films about him. So none of them with him. I the never movie. worked with him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and two were uh, almost tributes to his life. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Documentaries, which I thought was important. Yeah. To do, um, you know, Bruce was a he was a genius, man. You know. Yeah. Smoke and talk and, and, and talk together. You know. Uh, you could feel the energy. You know. I was. Quite sad when he passed. I was in Hong Kong. I had seen him like the week before uh, with my friend Fu Shang, who was who's the, uh, he was a Kung Fu movie as well, passed away. Yeah. With, you know, Shaolin from TV. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really, really nice guy. Like Unicorn Chan, another yeah. one of his friends who was a very good friend of mine. Yeah. Yeah. So there's so many accolades. Like I was looking at a couple of things too. Like you got 2002 instructor of the year in the black belt magazine and stuff like that. Of all your accomplishments award wise, what one is the closest to your heart that you really, really hold close to you and proud of? Honestly, I don't think of those, but I'm looking forward to March 3rd when being inducted into the international sports Hall of fame by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, I love this. Ohio. Amazing. Is that, is that part? Is that part? Is that part of the? Is that part of the Arnold Classic weekend? Yes. Yes. I'm getting my Terminator picture with Arnold. Wow. I love it. When when is this going to happen? Um, March third to March sixth. March third to March sixth. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited about that. I spoke to Arnold on the phone. And I said, no, who the fuck is this? You know, <laughs> I thought someone was pulling my leg, right? But he puts my friend, uh, Dr. Bob Goldman, on the line, who's yeah. the executive director of the yeah. Not Sports Man Fame. So, since so you've been inducted, and we're looking forward to seeing you the next part of class. I told my wife, I was like, Phew. you know, I'm not really into that. And I've been to a lot of horror film things all over the world, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's just, um, man, I'm going to be 80. What an honor to be inducted for your lifetime. Achievements. I don't even look at achievements. I think what I've tried to do with my art and with myself is to be the best version of myself that I could. I think when I went in the military, that affected my way of thinking for many years, including now. Yeah, the depression, you know, onset dementia, all of that stuff. Yeah. I live by the same creed I did when I joined the Marine Corps. Don't quit. And yeah, there's no excuses. None of that. That's how I live my life. Some people think I'm harsh in that. I think like that. But I think at the age I am, I really don't want. Deal with bullshit on any level, right? I mean, is it yeah. necessary? I don't think no, so. it's not. It's not. Life's life is way too short, and, and no one can tell me something that I haven't heard already in <laughs> yeah, of course. 80 years, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've, I've sat with presidents, I've sat with kings, I used to go to the palace, the Martha and Palace, I sat with Marcos and played chess and stuff. I played chess with um, Tricky Dick uh, Nixon. At my friend's uh, townhouse on 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 Sixty Eighth Street in Manhattan. What did what year was this on? You got some crazy stories about. Oh my god! What what year was what year was this on? He was no longer president. And so it was after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, but he bought, interesting, he bought a townhouse from the guy that produced my first Kung Fu movie, Seraphim Carol Alexis. I go there to Seraphim one day, then I go inside, and he's sitting there playing chess with Nixon. He goes, you're next. What do you do, <laughs> right? You say hello to the Secret Service guys, and, you know, you're just not a good loser. That's all no, I no. There's I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a reason he made it all the way to being a president, very famous president, too. Um, what's, your, what's, your, what's your mindset with, with America right now? With all, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of division. Mm-hmm. There's so much stuff right now happening. And I mean, you're, you're as an African-American, you going into the military, I mean, I'm sure racism is, is something that you've come across so many times. Let's go back to when I was in the Marine Corps. Yeah. I was lynched in 1963 in Kingston, North Carolina. They broke my jaw. They broke my arm. They ruptured my bone. They broke like seven or eight ribs. So how, how, how old were you? I was... Uh, Probably 19, 18, 20, 19? 20? 19, 20, 20. I was in the hospital two months. Um, And uh, it was a it was a horrible experience that um, maybe not be able to even wear a tie or a shirt that button um, for years. Imagine <clears throat> for years. The, the thought of it starts sweating. It's too much, you know. Um, no one was ever um, apprehended or convicted of anything. About it. They just figured that uh, 20, 30 of these guys that were uh, last minute uh, were okay to kill me because I was black. And I was in my uniform. I got kicked off the bus because I wouldn't sit in the back. You know, sometimes you, you, you can deal with it. You know, the, the CEO said, don't, don't cause any trouble in the town, you know, that kind of stuff. And, but sometimes it's going to happen. I did. I wanted to get my jaw broken, 10 teeth knocked out. I almost lost my eye. It was really bad. I, I suffered with those injuries for a long time. You know? So today, still. I don't have any regrets with my life. I, I tried to be the best person, husband, father, whatever, teacher, I try to bend myself every day. Making a conscious effort every day, not just lip service. Like, by action. Mm-hmm. Life now is different in them. As you age, so many of my good friends have died. You see, yeah. Uh, Steve McQueen. So many people are in the world. So many wonderful people can live in the life that they the time out of their life to give me some of themselves, some of their real you know? Yeah. I worked with Michael Jackson for a while. He was a wonderful man. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. I helped the other person to work in the celebrity security business. Who I worked for one of my friends who was a retired FBI agent, and he gave me your voice is very low. You talk a little louder? Sure. Yeah. Um, I had a chance to work Perfect. with executive security through an FBI retiree, one of my friends. And my, one of my first jobs was bodyguarding Oprah to the Emmys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She almost falls off the step, right? <laughs> like that, get off the stage. My hand is on her butt. She gives me the dirtiest look. <laughs> If I hadn't put my hands up to keep her from falling, she would have fell onto the floor, which was easily uh, four feet. Yeah. yeah. You know, that would have been devastating for anybody. Yeah. yeah. Stedman just looked at me and said, and, and I walked to <laughs> you. I'm glad this is over. <laughs> You know, I work with people like George Benson, we went out on the road, you know, 
all of Santana open for him. George is a wonderful man. I taught him martial arts for about 10 years. Oh, wow. Very careful about me bending his fingers and this and stuff like that because of his thing. Have you, kept, have you kept in contact with a lot of these people or no? It is over the uh, years. I spoke to George about uh, a year ago. Yeah. I speak, to, I, I speak to his son often. Yeah, very uh, cool. Because he, he just moved to Las Vegas. Yeah. And Robbie comes here uh, monthly. Oh, very interesting. I remember Robbie from when he was a little boy. We used yeah. to go from George's house to Anthony Quinn's house to play chess. You know, it was <laughs> like, wow. And I used to watch Tony Page and Scott. Yeah. He lived in a Frank Lloyd Wright home. Yeah. Truly, truly, water running underneath it. Yeah. From outside, it didn't look great, but inside it was amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So much space. But Tony was a very nice man. Very, very nice man. I was in awe of him. The guy was 75 years old when his uh, daughter was born. Wow. <laughs> wow. wow. How many children do you have? Um, five. Five children. What is, what is it? 55. How old? 55. And how old is the youngest? Um, 14. 14? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, is, what, is fatherhood, what does fatherhood mean to you back, back with your first and second child to what it means to you now? Well, I've had a very... Uh, interesting life as far as uh, marital status. Um, I've been married eight times. Eight times? Actually, yes. like... When I worked for Richard Pryor, he and I used to joke about this all the time. He said <laughs> to me before he passed away, Ronnie, which one of us is going to get wife number seven first? <laughs> he remarried his first wife just to fuck with me. He called me <laughs> <everything. laughs> <laughs> married seven times now. <sighs> So you've been married eight times. Yes. I, I, I've been a widower twice. Um, yeah. Our accident and cancer. Yeah. yeah. So, so we'll go back to that question. What does fatherhood mean to you now? And what is it? How did it, how does fatherhood changed? Because now obviously you have more time. You have more patience probably. Back then you're probably on the road a lot. You're doing movies. Yeah, but- like, how does that all change? What's changed is um, I, I was a single parent with my um, oldest son. She oh, you home. were? Yes. And, uh, my wife went to work, and I took care of my son. Did all of the diaper stuff, all of the bottle stuff, all this, every single day, because we were in St. Thomas. I got to know my backpack. Yeah. With his goodies, and we hit the road for the day, spend the day at the beach. Yeah. So you spend a lot of quality time, which is so these valuable. Yes, these past twenty years have been a godsend. Yeah, I mean, much better than ten years in St. Thomas. Yeah, one of the two hurricanes, I'd still be there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and ten years here in Hawaii. I mean, it's it's lovely. It's expensive, you know, but it's lovely. It's it's worth what you have to pay to be here because you go outside. It's like, yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. Like, huh? like garbage, not yeah, flowers. You don't see any littering stuff. You don't yeah. see any of that stuff. Yeah. When's the last time you've been back to New York? Um, just before the pandemic for the Urban Action Showcase. Okay. Okay. Do you ever do you ever miss that lifestyle that that hustle and bustle of New you York? Know I think that's what uh, was the road to me starting to feel not well. Yeah. That's, and physically. I realized that I moved to St. Thomas in 2005. Yeah, 2005 to, to 2011. Imagine in St. Thomas. Every yeah. morning, I'm going to take a mile and a half swim to a place called Shark Island in South Island Beach. So it's, you're, it's, essentially the, it's a little, little piece of heaven every morning. Take Kai with this little thing, sit on the beach, leave his goodies there. He's locked in. Take my mom has spent. I did that every morning for about nine years. Amazing. It was 
absolutely, I got the best shape ever. And I was also teaching martial arts at five schools, Montessori, Antilles, Liberton, all the public schools. I had the opportunity to teach my program, which was self-defense one on one. Yeah. I taught there for over six years. Yeah. Five schools, two hours at each school every morning during the week. Yeah. It was a wonderful chance for me to give back to my community see what, what the mindset of the children. New children, like from 2008 to 2009, they're not really interested in gaining the right mindset to do their best now. They want to wait till later. Later, yeah, 100%. They're not, they're not focused on the current moment. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's that it's too many distractions. Quite yeah. Possibly, you know, but uh, my 15 year old is a, is a video nerd. Yeah. I can get him off the, off the play, play I've, I've started, my, my kids are 13 and 15. My son's 13, my daughter's 15. And from day one, we've really integrated fitness into their life. And, and both my kids don't play video games. They are literally, they'll get home and they'll fight over who gets to get on the treadmill. They, they work out together every day almost. And okay. we've done that from a very young age. And it's, and it's probably the greatest thing I've done for them. So it's, 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 it has a lot to do with how you set the boundaries very early, right? Because, I mean, most kids with technology, I mean, that's, they, they'll lock themselves in a room and be in a room all day with Netflix or on their, yeah, on yeah, their yeah. laptop or on a YouTube video game and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you got to break that pattern, right? I mean, you, if you think of, and I'm sure your child was the same, when I grew up in Toronto, Canada, and I'd get home and, and there was no internet, there was no cell phones back then. I'd, I'd get, I'm 44. I'd get I didn't home know what a computer was. You, then, right? Yeah, of yeah. course. You would, get, you would get home and what was the first thing? You'd grab a peanut butter sandwich and say bye to your mom and your dad and go play. We play ball hockey. We play well, baseball. Park, That's it. Stuff. That's yeah. it. We play. And then, and, and it would be pitch black when you would hear your mom on the porch screaming your name and it's time to come home and have dinner. It'd be like seven, eight at night. And that was it. Yeah. And that was, and it was, it was the greatest childhood, the greatest childhood. Right. So I, I've tried to apply that with my kids where being outdoor, being active, uh, doing family out, like we go for family bike rides, family jogs. So we do stuff a lot, very, very, family orientated to get them from a young age just to go out and do and do and do and it's worked it's worked so far you know the, the video game thing it, it's amazing i mean sometimes i play with time uh, oh it's a it's a massive business it's a huge industry spent thousands on those games oh it's crazy yeah and interesting that i got um involved with the company called Datrix master Art. yeah they're in the Netherlands, and they created the, I, I gave them a story, a template, and everything, and we created a video game. It's called the Tao of the Black Dragon. It just dropped, and we're looking for Epic to pick it up. It's it's an animated, uh, me, like um, Mortal Kombat kind of stuff. Pretty cool. I mean... I, yeah, pretty I, amazing, of course. Yeah. You can go on to uh my, my site blackdragonfan.com and you can play the demo of it if you like. It's kind of cool. I mean, I'm not a video gamer. My son said eh, it needs a lot of work, you know, and <laughs> it's great. It's great to uh, see him showing interest in this because I believe this is the future. Digital electronic game. Is a oh yeah, 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 yeah! Everybody's yeah. everybody's going crazy with these. Like I'm not even into it right now. And I don't even know if you've heard of it. Everything with these NFTs. Have you heard of NFTs? Yes, yes. Like everybody's going insane right now, and you're getting all these big celebrities and and big entrepreneurs trying to push it as much as they can because it's it's it, 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 it. There's no stopping the next wave. If you think of the pandemic, the pandemic's essentially spud up our technology almost 10 years you're looking at grandmas and people that would never ever look at a facetime or a zoom call they had to adapt to, to talk to family so over the, the pandemic that 16 months have sped us up about 10 years in technology now so it's just where 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 where, where are we going to be in the next five years like it's it's it's, it's evolving so quickly 
amazing. It's awesome. It's a great, great time in life to live, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This has been a. It's this has been a. Down. This has Keep been a fun conversation, down. man. I love it. I love it. This has been such a fun conversation. I'm gonna have you on back again uh, when we get off the air. I want to talk to you a bit quickly. Um, anything? Actually, I'm gonna ask you one more last question. If something were to happen to you today, how would you want to be remembered, or described by your loved ones and your friends? He was a good guy. Simple and sweet. <laughs> love it. I, I love it. Them. And you know, when you get my age, you start thinking about that because so many of my friends have died. Yeah. You know, I did it like a learning called Super Weapon. Yeah. So more than half of the cast has already died. Yeah. And that's yeah. only 1976. Yeah. Yeah. My 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 dad just recently passed away. He's going out to oh, seven sorry. months. Yeah. And um 76. 76. Uh, yeah, he was, he, Ron, he was like, yeah, he was my best friend. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm the 44 year old that would talk to my dad on the phone two, three times a day. And uh, we had a very, very tight relationship. And so I was blessed in that way, but, um, he never smoked, never drank power walked every day. And, um, I talked to him on May 6th, 10 30 at night. We had a good conversation mm -hmm. and I got a call May 7th, uh, at uh, six in the morning, he passed away in my mom's arms. He had a sudden heart attack and that was it. They couldn't. Uh -huh. And, and it's, it's be honest, it's been seven months and I'm still like, you know, when people say old oh, time, heal, that's all bullshit. If that's you truly love bullshit. somebody and then you truly care about somebody, it's it, like, I, I, I want to grab, I want to pick up the phone every day and still talk to them. I say, I, I, for the first 70 days, I visited the cemetery every single day. Now I, now I still go two to three times a week. I've cut down a bit cause it was just getting too much, but it's, it's, it's hard, man. And I look at my mom, my mom and my dad were together. Uh, my mom was 13 when she met my dad and he had, he oh, wow. went, they met, uh, he was six years older. They met, uh, he went to the army and when he got back, uh, four and a half years later, uh, they got married and they moved to Canada wow. from Portugal. They moved Great to Canada. Story. They moved to Canada. They were together, married for 51 years. And my dad and my mom, my dad took early retirement at 55 and, uh, my mom, uh, took the same time early retirement. So for the last almost 25 years of his life, they were never one day apart. Which, Which is an amazing, story. amazing, beautiful story. But now I look at my mom where she had a life partner and now she's by herself. And it's so hard to see. So hard to see because it's, 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 you, it's like losing an arm or a leg, right? It's just that, that part my of you is not there. Two years ago. Yeah. She was 97. She lived here in Hawaii with me. And yeah. We would sit back and smoke a bowl together regularly. Yeah. Imagine 97. Yeah. Yeah. She couldn't roll anymore because of the arthritis, so I got a, a corn cob pipe. So, the last days of living in Hawaii from 90 to 97, her age. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I love it. Life's, life's it? precious, man. There's nothing like family. There's nothing like living with no regrets, right? I mean, I live with, you know, it's crazy part of it too, Ron, is I live with no regrets with my dad. I saw him as much as I could. I, I He was around the grandkids as much as I could, but you still have regrets. You still wish you did more. You still, you wish, you always have those thoughts after the fact, right? My regret would be that I didn't have a better relationship with my father. Yeah. He was quite abusive, you know? Yeah. I didn't know at the time that he was suffering from PTSD and stuff. He yeah, something that's something that's never known. No one talked about back then, right? He torpedoed in the war twice. So yeah, some of this, he was a virtual Navy, so some of his Marine friends being eaten by sharks, and he was like the only survivor on one of those. Yeah, means that he loved the ship. So he came back, uh, Harry, and then, but he, I, I understand now. Yeah, yeah. You know, to, for me to go to the military in see Vietnam and my brother was killed when he was 22 years old in Vietnam. Oh, baby. You know? Yeah. What doesn't work? Is, it doesn't work. We can't bond people into making them think and do what we want them to do. That's, that's impossible. Yeah. The idea can never be killed. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I just wish there was less hate and less fear. It's all fear anyway. It's yeah. all fear. 
No, I, I a thousand percent agree. And, and fear is something I, I, I talk about on a regular basis is, I mean, you have to live fearlessly, man. But fear yeah. is something that's taught to you as a kid. Yes. If you think of, and I say this all the time, Ron, if you think of, listen to your parents when you're a kid, like, don't touch the oven, you're going to bring your hand. Don't run the stairs, you're going to fall. Like, you're constantly, your subconscious mind as a child through your parents, through your teachers, through your educators, they're always teaching you fear. They're always blocking you from doing what you want to do. And that fear, as you grow older, especially nowadays with social media, with everybody, everybody's so scared of what their peers are going to see or what their peers are going to say. And it's, and it's, it feels like it's getting worse and worse with our society, right? Our younger society, right? Yeah. 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 This is where go. Sorry. The last uh, administration proved how crazy we are at this time in life. Oh, 100%. 100%. 100%. We have lost our minds. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's, it's and that was one thing we talked to, I, I mentioned prior. It's just, I think the biggest thing is not even the fear. I think it's more the division. It feels like there's always constant division between people. Well, and the, the more, more, whether it's through religion, whether it's through religion, whether it's through politics, the constant division just it just grows and it's and it manifests and it becomes evil and it just gets worse and worse. It's like a festering cancer. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I mean that's it, why I'm at this point in my life. I want everyone to enjoy themselves, be yeah. happy, be yeah. healthy for sure. Yeah, which is so important. Yeah, and and try to be the best person you can be. Forget what anyone else is doing. Control what you control, control what you could control. control. That's yeah. it. Yeah. If you can't control it, don't even think about it. Yeah. And live in the present. That's another thing, too. People are always worried about it's the future, always. worried about the past. Live in the present. It is only now. Yeah. It's yeah. Only. yeah. 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 I spoke to a friend of mine who passed away a couple of days ago. I inducted him into the International Sports, excuse me, the Ultimate Warrior Hall of Fame, which is an event I hold for years. Yeah. And, uh, he sent me an acceptance speech, but I couldn't. I couldn't play it publicly because he looked like he was uh, dying. And I said to my wife, looks like he's, he's dying. Two days later, um, he died. Said to him, it was so sad. You know? Yeah, very sad. Very sad. Very sad. This has been an f- incredibly fun conversation. Uh, I definitely want to have you on back. This is, uh, man, you have, you, you have stories that could go on forever and ever and ever, man. You live such a way to do a zombie movie with Leo Fong. You are. Yeah. Yeah. Called the Sabbath seven, man. And and, and, and you don't, you don't stop, buddy. You don't stop. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Uh, It's called make a difference. It's like boys in the hood, but with martial arts gangs. You don't stop, buddy. I love it. 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 This has been a Maverick Pictures finally picked up my documentary film. Yeah. So that's uh it's being shown around now. Let's see what happens with that. Hopefully gets on hopefully gets on Netflix or something. Took almost 10 years to get it done. Yeah. Oh, it's this it's a process. Anything like that is a long process. Long, long process. You gotta keep going, right? I love it. I love it. And life is good. Be happy and healthy, my friend. Do the best. Thank really. you, buddy. Thank That's you. All we can do, you know. Thank, Thank you. you. Wish everybody around you the same thing. And happy know. Thanksgiving and all that stuff. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's a wrap for today. I want to thank our guest, Ron, for taking time of his incredibly busy schedule to be a guest on the Jeff Nosing Podcast. What a fun conversation. If you guys enjoy this podcast as much as I have, like all weeks, do us a favor and tell your friends, tell your family, spread the word. We're trying to build something special here. Leave a review. Five stars will be absolutely amazing. Myself, my team love spending time reading the reviews. Until next week, guys, keep moving forward. This podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. With the current climate in this world, it's now more important than ever to take stock in your mental health and for once, take time to work on yourself. BetterHelp offers a personalized online counseling and therapy service that will connect you to a safe and private online environment. BetterHelp is here to assess you with your needs and match you with your own licensed therapist. It's a lot more affordable than your traditional counseling and financial aid is always available. Right now, Jeff Knows Inc. listeners get an extra 10% off your first month just by visiting BetterHelp.com 
betterhelp.com forward slash Jeff knows. That's right. Visit B E T T E R H E L P.com forward slash Jeff knows to get 10% off your first month. 